Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Hey guys, we're your hosts, M and J, and today we're reviewing the Masters of the Universe Revelation tie-in comic, while also giving some thoughts on the show coming up. There's been a lot of inconsistencies with the marketing for this show. We talked about some of them in the previous video we did on it, like how Kevin Smith claimed to be such a huge fan of it, despite the fact that he got dates wrong, and an old tweet surfaced where he claims that he was never a fan of He-Man. And after we made that video, a clip from the reality show Comic Book Men surfaced, where Smith claimed again that he's not a fan of He-Man. I have no love for He-Man. I just, I, I just, I'm not... I, know, I have no love for He-Man either, but he's got a place in, in the world. But when marketing the show, Smith claimed that it was a huge part of his childhood and how much he adored Masters of the Universe. Now there seems to be a lot of backpedaling when it comes to this show. Like on Twitter, Smith claims that this isn't actually a sequel to the original 80s cartoon and more of a spiritual successor, even going as far as to say that he's always said this, which is really weird because the has from the beginning been billed as a sequel to the original Filmation cartoon, that this was a show that fans had been waiting for decades to see. Even the description from Netflix claims it's a sequel, so this is all very confusing. We keep being told to ignore official descriptions for the show, even though the one about Tila being the main character was pretty much confirmed. I wish they'd just been upfront about everything to begin with, whether they're mega fans of Masters of the Universe, or this is just a paycheck from Mattel, or whether this is supposed to be a sequel to the original cartoon, or a standalone take for this franchise, instead of giving us conflicting information. Anyway, this comic is the actual prequel to Revelation, instead of the 80s cartoon. But if I'm being totally honest, this comic came off more like fanfiction to me, so maybe advertising it as a sequel really was for marketing purposes only. The comic starts with King Randor being unable to sleep because he keeps hearing this strange noise, and it's making him uneasy. But Queen Marlena believes this is all in his imagination, which seems a bit dismissive. This is a world of magic after all. Him picking up on some buzzing noise doesn't seem like it would be that crazy for this world. She starts going over all the defenses that their fortress home has, but in a way that's acting like he's ridiculous to worry, instead of a reassuring way. I wish she was being more supportive and telling him that they were gonna get to the bottom of this, instead of acting like it's just his ears. He tells her there's actually a lot of bad stuff out there in the universe, but she asks him if he believes they have better things to do than bother some king. But no, I don't think so. I think bothering a king is right up their alley. He tells Marlena he's going to come back to bed soon, only to be attacked by a tentacle monster. So good job, Marlena. I guess he was right to worry. No weapons are working on this thing because everything is just passing right through it. But when He-Man draws his sword, the creature disappears. King Randor isn't responding, so they bring him to Castle Grayskull. The sorceress says that this creature is called the Orlax, and that it's coming contact with that blade before, but He-Man's confused because he's never fought this thing, so the sorceress has to remind him that he's not the first one to wield this sword. There's a lot of exposition in this book that's telling the characters things they should already know. As a side note, I'm not sure why He-Man and Battle Cat are speaking like this. To me, it's coming off as kind of Thor-like, and He-Man isn't Thor, but Battle Cat wants to know what's going on with the king. Apparently, he's been poisoned with some kind of mortal venom. The venom is some kind of magic that the sorceress isn't able to pinpoint. She thinks that if the beast were here, she'd be able to work it out. Tila thinks that Adam should be with his father. I'm also wondering where Queen Marlena is right now. Maybe she should be here too. Must be kind of awkward that he was right though. He even actually tries to tell her that he is Adam, but he's interrupted by Orko, saying that he'll keep the royal family in the loop. We know from interviews that Tila is going to find out about He-Man's secret identity in the show, and it's gonna be a big deal with big consequences. It seems like He-Man doesn't actually have a problem with her knowing, or telling her. Battle Cat wants to help the king, and the sorceress has a plan, but He-Man doesn't get it. The sorceress takes him to the cosmic corridor and explains that it doesn't just take people through space, but also time. So her plan is to send He-Man back in time to when the creature came in contact with the sword and try to find some answers. He-Man is afraid his father's going to die before he finds out he's actually Adam, but the sorceress reminds him that his secret identity is to protect protect those he loves, and tells him to get going. Personally, I feel like she could have spared a kind word. I don't know why everyone is so blunt in this. They feel more like coworkers than friends. So He-Man enters the portal and sees a flashback of himself and his father when they were younger. Randor asks if he wants to know a secret, but Adam says that they aren't supposed to keep secrets. Ugh, we get it. They don't have to keep harping on the secret thing. Anyway, Randor says that the sword is not a sword, but an extension of his arm. He-Man arrives in the past and actually sees 
sees King Grayskull giving his son the same exact lecture as Randor did. Also in this version, they've re-swapped King Grayskull to be black. According to the show's director, he claims that he was worried about creating new characters because they might be rejected by the audience, which I can't help but feel like misses the point of Masters of the Universe. New characters pop up all the time, or they expand on the old characters in new ways in the new shows. Just look at Stinkor. He originally premiered as an action figure for part of the toy line, but then he was expanded upon in the 2000X show. Or, you know, She-Ra, the character they created specifically because they had a sizable female audience and wanted to give them a hero. It's not like they gender swapped a well-known male character from the series and called it a day. They created a new character and even made her own series for kids to follow. So I really have no idea what the director is talking about. He claims that it's a big hurdle to introduce a new character into a line of well-established characters and they're harder to accept as canon. Again, She-Ra. But he insists that because no one cares about Sir Laserlot, no one would care about a new black character. It's almost like execution matters. Was Stinkor really a popular character before the 2000X series? This is the guy who's directing the show. This entire post is just the weirdest thing. He says that he questions the need to have two giant blonde white dudes in the pantheon of masses of the universe. Well, they are related. It's not that surprising to have people who are related looking similar to each other. It's not even focusing on the fact that they have mixed ancestry now. It's just that they saw two blonde buff guys and thought that was problematic. So instead of just giving people a new hero that they can root for, they took this shortcut just because it was easier and they wouldn't have to put any effort into it. But back to the story. He-Man sees King Grayskull training his two young sons, but then the Snake Men unleash that giant tentacle monster, the same one that attacked King Randor. This time it gets one of the princes, Dare. Grayskull stabs one of the Snake Men, asking why they would ever attack an innocent child. Before he dies, he tells the king that he should have kept their identity secret so they wouldn't have been targeted, but now Dare is suffering the same way King Randor is. So the king and queen go to the elders to try to find a cure. They say that this thing exists in two different dimensions, so interacting with it will be difficult, whether it's to talk to it or fight it. Grayskull says he's only interested in killing it. The elders agree to help, but they're going to have to break a few rules. And by break a few rules, they mean make a deal with a devil in order to get the job done. According to the narration, they know this is going to be a bad idea in the long run, and pretty much admit this is only for short-term gain. But they split the sword into two parts, one light and one dark. That way he can stab the creature in two different dimensions. The queen asks him to reconsider though. She can sense the creature's thoughts, but can't understand what it's trying to say. But she can tell that it isn't actually evil, it's just being used by the snake men. What a twist! But Grayskull refuses, insisting that it's just a mindless monster, despite his wife's abilities, and all he wants to do is kill it and feast on its bloody entrails. Gross. She questions what deal he struck with that demon, since he's clearly not acting rationally, insisting on being violent when it looks like there's another option they can explore. So they face the Snake Men, and King Grayskull uses a sword to attack the monster, and it looks like he's destroyed, but now that Dare has his connection to the monster severed, he dies for real. What a twist! Grayskull can't understand what happened. The queen says she can't find any poison in the body itself, but apparently it was some kind of psychic link that was too strong for a human to handle, and severing the connection ended up killing him, but now they may never know what it was trying to tell them. Way to go, Grayskull! But then out of nowhere, the monster comes back and tries to get the other prince, forcing He-Man to intervene. So are we supposed to pity this creature or fear it? Because I'm getting mixed signals here. King Grayskull thanks He-Man for saving his son and asks who he is. He-Man just answers that he's a friend. He apologizes that they have to meet under these circumstances, but he promises that their son's legacy will live on. As He-Man is leaving, he says that they should probably disguise the Great Hall to look like something more threatening and frightening, so it would be less likely to be targeted. So I guess that explains the whole Grey Skull motif. But to be honest, I don't think making the castle look spooky worked. I mean, Skeletor is constantly trying to get in there. And admittedly, it looks like he would fit right in. He goes back through the cosmic corridor and ends up seeing a flashback of himself with his father. Randor tells Adam he would have preferred to be He-Man than King, but he realized that it wasn't his destiny. He tells Adam that it's their job to be the scepter while it's He-Man's job to be the sword. I think this is supposed to be a nice father-son moment, but this is also like the fourth time they've brought up secrets, with King Randor saying that if he were He-Man, he would have to rule a turn in disguise.
dies because He-Man has the burden of carrying secrets that the king should never carry. There's a part of me that feels like the relationship between all these characters is a little strange. Adam didn't care to go to this party, so Randor takes the opportunity to talk about how he wanted to be He-Man. It feels like these conversations aren't very natural, and they're more a reason to talk about secrets because they're really focusing on the secret identity thing. It just seems a little excessive. But He-Man makes it back and explains to the others that there's no physical venom, and that the creature traveled to Eternia trying to communicate, but it ran into the Snake Men, who realized that its attempts to communicate was fatal, so they used it as a weapon. But He-Man brought one of its limbs back, and it turns out the Oralax can grow back from it, so now the Sorceress is trying to use her magic to communicate safely. The Oralax seems to be frightened of them, which Man-at-Arms is confused by because he thinks that there's no way they could take this thing. But He-Man says that it might be afraid because it's no it's being controlled by someone else. The last page of this book is Skeletor with Evil Lynn, and apparently he's been controlling it. Apparently he was trying to kill He-Man, but he was also trying to decipher the message that it was trying to send all those years ago. But we don't get to find out the message, at least not in this issue. Overall, I can't say that this comic really put all of our fears about the show to rest. I'm still hoping for the best, but I don't have a lot of faith in the team behind it. They released another trailer for the show, and the action looks really fun, although some of it's a little confusing, like Tila saying that she hates magic, and that she built her life on truth away from it. Tila's surrounded by magic all the time, and Masters of the Universe has always been a blend between science fiction and fantasy. Orko is always studying magic, the sorceress is such a vital ally, so I'm not sure why she would hold this kind of opinion. She also says this while throwing down her headpiece and walking out of the court, and then the next time we see her she's wearing her Mad Max type outfit. So a part of me wonders if this is actually because she hated magic, or if the trailer is just spliced out of order. Based on what Kevin Smith said, I'm willing to bet that this is actually because she found out about He-Man, and she was so upset about them keeping a secret from her that she walked out. But Adam does want to tell his close friends and family, but basically the moral of this comic was the importance of keeping a secret identity. Adam literally saw a child die, all because they didn't keep his identity secret. So while I can't understand why she would be upset, I do think she could be a little more understanding of the situation. But I guess we'll have to wait and see how it plays out in the show. But that's our opinion. What did you think of this comic? Do you think it did a good job of leading us into Revelation? We'd love to hear from you, so leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching, we really appreciate it. Before we go, we want to give a shout out to our members. Caleb Nelson, Stutania, Tyrant Carnivore, Adam K, Shiny Orc Boy, The Rabbit Mancer, Hunter Rose, General Bolivar, Depth Charge Media, Samaru163, Kopitio Bozinski, Gabby Hime, Sandy Martin, Verdant Range, Butcher7 Actual, Dash Hound, and Bandit Bane. Thank you all so much for the support. If you'd like to become a member, you can hit the join button next to the subscribe button. We also have a buy me coffee if you want to support us that way. But if you enjoyed this video, you can leave a like and subscribe to the channel to see more content from us. That helps us out a lot too, and it's free. So thank you all again, and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye everyone. Bye guys. Thank <laughs> you.